like to introduce Ms. Nancy Rosenthal from the League of Women Voters. She's going to be moderating for us. Now, we do not have any microphones, so the candidates, we didn't set up microphones, though. so the candidates will be speaking out. We ask that you not talk while the candidates are speaking so everybody can hear them. If you have any questions, please fill out a card in the back. It will be brought up to the front and given to the moderator. The moderator will sort through them and hand them through to the uh, candidates that are speaking. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, because we don't have uh, microphones, I strongly urge people to move forward to the empty seats up front. Uh, that way, if you can't hear, or, or that way it will be easier for you to hear, and if the candidates aren't speaking loud enough, I won't hear from the back of the, of the room. I can't hear you, okay? So let's kind of take control of this and make the best of the situation. So what we've done already tonight is uh, we have drawn uh, straws, so to speak, and uh, Ms. DeLong is going to go first in her uh, introduction, and then Mr. Stipe, and then Ms. Figueroa. And, uh, Steph. Steph. Steph, okay, I will tell you all night long, I will get it wrong, okay? So just <laughs> forgive me, okay? And forgive me, sir, but I, you know, will do the very best I can. Uh, you could keep reminding me. Uh, Dolores here is going to be my timekeeper and she darling okay. okay you can see how great i am she's got a 30 second and a stop sign okay so uh so that takes care of that the introduction each of them will have three minutes and, and then from the questions that you all have submitted uh, and you can submit those questions throughout the evening uh, I will go and ask the candidates the questions. Uh, the questions are to be something that all three of them can answer. Obviously, you don't want to say, uh, uh, Mrs. Long, uh, Ms. Long, how come uh, you know you drive a sports car and have a lot of money? Okay, that's not an appropriate question. It needs to be a question that's about the issues about running that applies to all of them. Okay. Nothing nothing specific. Obviously, obviously nothing derogatory or offensive, etc. Yes, ma'am. On the questions, on the paper, for the, on the card for the questions, they said you can ask all the candidates or one candidate. Well, yes, and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to sort that through. You're absolutely correct. So you're you're good in that respect. You know what we want to what we want to prevent is that Miss DeLong is the only one answering questions tonight okay that's what we want to prevent because then we won't have the opportunity to hear the other two candidates okay so i think we all got the drift on that one okay so uh, as i said uh mr long will go first then mr stiff stiff, stiff and then mr Figueroa. okay <laughs> so three minutes uh mr long thank you good evening my name is Deborah DeLong. Many of you know me already. Um, I was raised in Hempstead. I went to school here from kindergarten through high school. The high school experience is one of the best educational experiences I have had. I'd like to see it happen again. Um, I left here, left Hempstead, only for a period of time to go to undergraduate school. I went to Clark University in Massachusetts. I received a BA in, psycho in sociology and a minor in psychology. Right after, I was so excited about social work. It's something that I've wanted to be since I was 13. I entered the New York University School of Social Work and obtained a master's degree. Just to get all the, up the up whatever credits and certificates. I've earned two additional certificates, one in uh, a mental health specialty in social work because I loved it and found it so very helpful in all the positions that I've taken. Um, back in night first, I was hired in Roosevelt as a social work for three years. And for the last 37 years, I've worked for Hempstead Public Schools. Um, 17 years I worked as a direct line 
social worker, and I loved it, every minute of it. It never occurred to me to apply for an administrative position. I never sought it. I was approached and uh, asked if I wanted to administrate pupil personnel services. My first response was, no, I don't want to do that. But when I thought about it, <clears throat> my experience in social work brought me to so many different areas in the district. It made me familiar with lots of different uh, de sub-departments. And I began over the course of about a month to feel um, competent enough to learn from that experience and present some leadership to the department. Uh, it was a rigorous um, interview process through both seats, but I came out as number one candidate. Um, well, I don't know what I can say in 30 minutes, 30 seconds? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's now time for me to retire, and I find it a privilege and an honor <coughs> to be considered a candidate for the Board of Education. Excuse me, Mr. Stein. Thank you. Stan, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Hempstead community, teaching staff, and other staff that make up the Hempstead Public Schools. My name is Randy Stith, and I'm a product of the Hempstead Public School System. I came through Jackson Annex, then to Jackson, Maine, went on to the middle school, and graduated here in 2008, a year early. Um, I went on to go further my career in education at Nassau Community College, where I graduated in 2011 with an associate's degree in liberal arts. I'm further in study, um, further in my studies now. I'm in paramedicine. I am currently an emergency medical technician. I work at the emergency room and emergency medical center, Rockwell Center, and also for the Center of Emergency Services for Northwell Hospital. I give back to my community daily. I'm a three-year lieutenant of the Hempstead Fire Department. I was recently appointed to the emergency management team in the Incorporated Village of Hempstead. And not just that, I respond to emergencies in this very building on a daily basis. I come and I assist the students when they have medical emergencies, but I also come and support the students as well in this district. I attend almost one sporting event a month, whether it be basketball, football, track and field, because I feel so connected to these kids. Next year I'll be 10 years out. And I do recognize that there's an emergency going on here when it concerns the Hempstead School District. So I'm happy as well to be a candidate for the Hempstead Public School Board. And my focus is putting the students first. Conversations should be student focused and all decisions made should be with the students' best interest at heart. So on May 16th, I pray that you will elect me as your new trustee to the Hempstead School Board and we can start to put the students first. Thank you. Ms. Figueroa. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Melissa Figueroa. I am actually currently serving on the Board of Education. I've been serving the district for one year in that role. Uh, I actually finished out a seat that was vacated by the former trustee, Ricky Cook, and then uh, which Reverend Gates was appointed to by BOCES. So for this past year, I joined the board and learned quickly. I almost feel like it's a, kind of a baptism by fire experience because when I arrived, uh, at the table and learned the inner workings of the district, I saw that um, our situation, uh, the, the starting with the business office, was in worse condition than I had anticipated. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, to tell you more about myself, my family moved to Hempstead in 1985, so I was five years old. That makes me 37-year-old young professional. I was able to purchase a home in Hempstead right down the road uh, from the house I grew up in in 2011. And I quickly learned uh, what it was to bear the heavy burden uh, as a tax uh, payer and homeowner in the district. Um, and so that was uh, something I learned a lot about from 20 to 2011. Prior to that, um, I stayed local to go to university. I attended Adelphi and completed my bachelor's in uh, com community communications and went returned to Adelphi uh, graduate school 
to pursue um, an education in teaching English to speakers of other languages. Uh, at that time, while I was at, in grad school, I had the privilege to serve in Hampstead School District, and then went on to take actual job in the district. I worked in the David, what's now actually David Patterson, um, which at that time was Fulton Elementary. And I also was able to work in the evenings at the middle school, teaching English to the adult learners. Uh, that experience was priceless for me. Uh, I was able to kind of get a gauge on what it was to be an educator in working in a district like ours. I went on from there, um, was actually laid off. So I understood very quickly how um, things happen in the district with regard to teacher retention and sort of this issue that I was able to address as one of my first orders of business when I joined the board. Um, if you all recall, there was a, quite an extensive teacher's list, uh, excess list of about 70 some odd staff. And when we brought in the new superintendent, the interim superintendent, we were able to reduce that list down to about 17. So, um, and just to tell you, before I became an elected official, as a private citizen, I pride myself on the fact that ever since I was a teenager, uh, I was an activist. And so I remain an activist through and through. Anytime there's any social injustice, I'm, I will stand up and speak to it. Thank you. Um, so we will now begin uh, the questions. And uh, the first question uh, is for everyone. And uh, Mr. Uh, Steph, thank you everybody, I got that right. You will, you will go first. You will have one and a half, one minute to answer the question. Each candidate, one minute. One minute. One minute. Okay. So, why are you seeking a seat on the board? Is it to make a name for yourself, or do you have a specific quality or qualifications that will help our district improve the education of our students? Okay, first things first, I already have a name for myself. It's Randy Stiff. My mother gave it to me <laughs> some years ago, August 11, 1990. Um, also, in the community, I'm no stranger. I am Hempstead. Hempstead birthed me, raised me, and I'm an active and productive member in the community today. Um, I failed to mention in my <coughs> greetings that I am a former HR specialist for J.C. Penney's, which is a large retail company. My job there was to interview, hire, source, and um, do evaluations. My, my focus in running is also to make sure that the school board reflects the community. There needs to be inclusion and diversity. And you can't have transparency with the school board if you don't have people who reflect the community and willing to communicate with their neighbors. So as a member of the school board, I look forward to being transparent and being available to the community. So that way, when we make decisions, they will be with the community's input. That's the type of reputation I hope to have when I'm elected. Thank you. Ms. Figueroa? Can I ask a question? Uh, <laughs> be my pleasure. Which one is it here? Uh, when I said it. Uh, you know what, I need to write it down. Oh, here it is. I got it. Why are you seeking a seat on the board? Is it to make a name for yourself, or do you have a specific quality or qualifications that will help our district improve the education of our students? Thank you. So the reason why I want to run to keep my seat is because when I joined the board, a lot of work needed to take place. And I'm happy to say that um, I was able to help in uh, start a lot of the work that had to happen, working collaboratively with the board. Um, we have a vision for this district. I have a vision. And I know for a fact that our students in this district have the very same potential that the students in our neighboring district, districts such as Garden City have. I know for a fact, having taught here, that our kids have the ability to become great, valuable citizens, not only to our village, but global citizens. And so I think it's so important that really we all know that we can have a part to play, and we're all leaders, 
And so I'm simply stepping up so I can continue the work forward that's already begun so many years ago. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Wong? I hate asking you to repeat it again. Oh, gosh. Christopher. You just really want me to do this, don't you? <laughs> Why are you seeking a seat on the board? Is it to make a name for yourself, or do you have a specific quality or qualifications that will help our district improve the education of our students? Well, first of all, Hempstead, Hempstead Schools, they have to commit the, the, uh, the district at large, the teachers, the administrators, they've invested a lot in this, from high school all the way through, invested a lot. When I was hired here, uh, I was given a tremendous opportunity and flexibility when, to develop new programs, to do innovative things, and I was supported. I, they invested a lot of time and a lot of money in me, and I feel at this juncture, now that I'm old, I am old, okay, now that I'm old, that it's time for me to give back. I'm not looking to use it as a stepping stone politically or any otherwise. It's not necessary. This is what I want to do. It's my pleasure to serve. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Figueroa, you're next. And it seems that there are several questions around the superintendent mm -hmm. and the uh, interim newly elected superintendent. Um, in, uh, so uh, that would be directed particularly to the current board member. How was, how was that person chosen? Why was it not uh, a more transparent uh, process um, and uh, so that there could be input from the community? And then in regards to that, um, the, the people that are, are, are not on the board, uh, how, would you, how would you have handled uh, the situation? Now just so everybody knows, some of those processes and proceedings may not be able to be public. I don't know how it is here. So Ms. Figueroa may not be able to give full details of this and would need a more specific question if you're looking for something specifically. However, I think all the candidates can address this issue now. Thank you. Just would you mind, I'm sorry, just repeat that. Oh my question. gosh. <laughs> what, makes, uh, what, what makes the current elected superintendent more qualified than the current uh, Dr. Atiba? And uh, why did you vote yes for the superintendent, specifically sure. to you, without allowing community input and a more transparent process? How would the non-sitting board members, how would you have done the process? So, the time starts now. Please. Uh, the current superintendent had an opportunity to apply for the permanent position. And so when we hired the current super, the current superintendent, uh, it was known that he was coming in as an interim with a one-year contract. When the board pursued the national search, we also um, <laughs> afforded our current superintendent to apply. He chose not to do that, and therefore, um, as a result, not completing the process, <coughs> as all the other candidates had to, he decided not to um, remain as the permanent <coughs> superintendent. Uh, also, one of the reasons, and I just want to speak to the transparency issue with regard to the community being involved. So the facts are, and it's really important for everyone in the community to know that over 560 individual members of our community participated in the process of finding a super. We were intentional to hire a, an executive search firm and pulled from a national <coughs> search. Um, and yes, just in conclusion, the district did include um, the community and there were two public forums wow. um, and surveys that were collected. Yes, okay. so Hold on, no, excuse me. If you have a question from the audience, let's be respectful, write them down and we'll answer them. But let's be respectful of the candidates. Uh, Mr. Smith. Still. Still. Like the same time that she got? Excuse me? Uh, be afforded the extra time that she did? <laughs> she didn't get extra time. That's what they were trying to tell you. They wasn't asking the question. They were trying to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Could you let me moderate that? I, I, I want you to. I would appreciate no, if
I would, excuse me, sir, that was very disrespectful. Sorry, I'm Okay, please do not do that. I'm not here to be graded, sir. Am I able to start? You are able to start. Thank you. Um, matter of fact, can you please read the question again? So, uh, how, how would you handle the process of hiring a, a superintendent? Can you read the again? I'm sorry. I know, I know uh, pertain to. Our current trustee. The current board member, what makes the future newly elected superintendent more qualified than the current Dr. Atiba? Uh, why did you vote yes, specifically? And giving the, the community to meet the finalists, not giving the community time to meet the finalists and provide feedback. Uh, so they're talking about transparency. How is a non-sitting board member, would you handle it going forward? Okay. Um, to address the issue of my belief on why they voted when they voted at the last board meeting to hire a new superintendent is because they have no respect for the community. They don't care to be transparent, even though they ran on transparency. If you knew the community, you would know that the community would find it disrespectful that you would take action on hiring someone for four years without taking the input of the community. They could have at least afforded us the opportunity to know who the last three finalists were. Um, also, if I was in her position, I would actually be transparent with the community. You know, 560 some odd surveys, it could have been 561 because I never got a survey, never knew that there was a survey, and I would definitely like to take part in that process. Um, I don't know why um, this new superintendent may be more qualified than Dr. Tiba Weezer, but I do know if I was Dr. Tiba, I wouldn't want to apply either because I would have to work with a difficult board who think that they're actually the superintendent and want to allow the superintendent to do his job, their job. So that's my belief on that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wong? Uh, I have to say that uh, transparency wasn't very apparent. Uh, once we got to a point where we had three candidates for recommendation, I think not that the, the decision didn't rest with the board, we understand that, their, their authority in that situation. But I think it would have done wonders for the relationship with the community and with me to hear and have some type of uh, forum where the three, we can meet the three candidates and submit to the board our impressions. So, you know, that's far. But if you don't, if we did, give input online and paperwork, but we needed to see the individuals and see how they operate and present themselves, him or herself. So therefore, I think we should have definitely brought them before the community and let the community judge. That was really a little bit unfair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and next, uh, Ms. Ms. DeLong, you're first down that for, okay. with this question. So there's, a, there's several questions concerning funding and concerning uh, the tax base, uh, increasing or decreasing the school taxes. How would you do that? Um, and also, along with that, controlling spending, the growth of spending, uh, those sorts of questions in order to give the children of the district the best possible education. Taxes are a part of life. I know I sit in the position of many of my neighbors in that taxes are over the top for us, often the times. However, we're willing to make that sacrifice if in fact we're getting the bang for our buck, so to speak. If our children are benefiting from what we're paying for, that's fine. If it's going on the children, it's great. But when we see red, um, the, the uh, the waste that we've seen, I mean, materials we didn't need, books that are thrown out that are not needed, brand new things, it's bad, very bad. So therefore, I think <coughs> that we haven't been considered a prospect, and it doesn't do anything but make the relations between the administrative body, the board, and the community. Uh, Mr. Smith? Um, I have to echo what she, uh, what Mr. Long said in part. You know, taxes are a daily part of living. People have to pay taxes. If you own home, you're going to pay your taxes. If you pay, if you pay rent, 
you're paying somebody, and that's your taxes as well. Um, but the money should be given towards the students. So when you're talking about wasteful spending, you know, anytime we can afford to pay somebody $2,750 a day to do the same job that the superintendent and the business official is doing, and that money's gonna go to the students, then that's wasteful spending. Amen. Whenever you find money to pay the entrance business official a thousand dollars a day and someone in the business office an extra thirty thousand a day, that's money that can be pulled to hire, let's say, security guards, which only have thirteen security guards in the middle school, which is totally an unfair ratio to the amount of people in that building. So wasteful spending is, you know, a huge problem, but that's also discretion of the school board because they knew about it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Figueroa? So people in this room know very well that for many, many years our school district was run by boards who did not necessarily have the best interests of our students. <laughs> um, it's well known, our district, for cronyism. We're going to be talking about school nepotism. taxes, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's the question. Mm. <laughs> Good. So our district is well known for cronyism and nepotism and a, a, a number of um, things that go on financially that are not um, not exactly going to lead us to fiscal stability. Um, with that, it's the board's responsibility to develop a fiscally sound budget. Um, and essentially, with everything that went wrong in our district, it, the result was a 38% graduation rate. So the solution to this is to, as a board member, to ensure that every single tax dollar is accounted for in our budget and that that money is used ultimately for the well-being and the development of the educational success of our students, not for anything else. Thank you. I missed you. Uh, most, if not all, of our schools are overcrowded. What have you and the current board uh, started, how have you started to uh, address the situation, especially at Front Street School, uh, not paying for, uh, with a vent problem, and the management of that building will not pay for the replacement of the vent. And the high school has approximately 1,000 students over its capacity, and we have eighth graders about to come over. Can you speak one more time? Sorry, the first part, so much to have again. Okay, so they're talking about that the schools are overcrowded. So is there anything that you can do about that? as well as other issues at the school it seems like there's a maintenance a building issue and then additionally there's going to be uh, more kids coming over to the high school a thousand plus next year so how can those issues be addressed with my involvement in the fire department i know firsthand how these buildings in the school district are currently filled to its max and they've been filled to capacity for the past maybe two to three years. Um, and, and, and it is an issue that we're actually renting all these portables and these, um, you know, the, the building on Front Street because that's a budgetary issue. We, we're doing wasteful spending. And some of these buildings or portables are old. So what I would do is definitely, number one, reopen Washington Robes. Let's come up with a plan to reopen it. There has been two confirmed working fires in that building since it closed. It's time to rebuild it, put elementary schools there, and let's also get funding from the state to help pay for these kids that we have to educate that came here unaccompanied <coughs> or came here as refugees. Nobody's saying we don't want to educate them, but we're, we're, we're supposed to get a certain amount of money for each kid, and I want to say it's like 12000 per kid. So those monies are due to us, and we should lobby the state to get it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Figueroa. Oh. So uh, this, since 2007 to 2010, over $33 million was spent to uh, develop or to address some of the needs of the buildings that are you know, facing you know, mold issues and roofs and boilers. Um, Prospect was built, but still Prospect is, uh, continues to have leaks and a number of other building um, facilities issues that are not being properly addressed. Prospect is the newest schoolhouse that we have in the district. Uh, what I would like to see, um, as Mrs. Smith mentioned, is the leveling of roads 
that building should be leveled and a state-of-the-art school facility should be put there in its place. Um, right now, the governor is, um, there's, there is money available from the state. If we were to do a development, we would be, this district would be refunded 84%. So that's 83 cents on the dollar the district would be be refunded um, in order for us to, to do a build out. So absolutely, our school district is a heavy burden with it, overcrowded. So I hope we can address that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. DeLong, I think we have to look at this particular problem on multi-levels. One, we're facing September and an entire district full of children. We're not going to have time to rebuild roads for that purpose. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to bite the bullet, look around to other districts that have empty buildings, or what, put our heads together, get together and have a think tank to decide how we're going to handle the immediacy. In between, we need to have a facility study, an anal anal analysis of all of our buildings. No more Band-Aids here and Neosporin over there. We have got to take a real good hard look. These are all buildings. Finally, yes, we do need to make a long-term plan, such as rebuilding, road school, and perhaps even some other facilities. But we've got to take it multi-level because we're sitting on top of a time bomb here, starting in September. Right. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Stith, uh, this question involves uh, it involves about uh, teaching Spanish. Um, in the school district, why are we only interested in teaching English to non-speaking English students, but not teaching a second language to English-speaking students? All students should graduate bilingual starting no later than uh, grade two. And uh, I will say that this was a question last year uh, at the forum. And uh, those that were here, I think, remember it. And it seems like it's continuing. Mm -hmm. So how can you address that issue, that question of the community? I don't know if you answer the question, but I think the community, from conversations that I've had with people, are bilingual is not just English and Spanish. And it's not just speaking English and Spanish. To be bilingual, in a, in a, in a sense, is to be able to read, speak, comprehend and write two or more languages. So yes, the makeup of the community are mostly Latin, Latinos or you know African American descent, but there's other nationalities um, that make up this community. So I think it would be a great advantage for our students to learn to be fluent in two or more languages. And we shouldn't just be uh, teaching those who don't speak the language of, Span of English to Spanish students. There's exactly. other students in our district that don't speak English but don't speak Spanish as well. Mm -hmm. And we need to be affording all students the right mm -hmm. to be to learn how to speak English and the English speaking students to know how to communicate in other languages, not just Spanish. So as a follow up to that, because I think part of this question also involves some funding. So how are you gonna fund <laughs> that kind of program? No. How are you gonna fund either one that it has, uh, works with uh, a bilingual Spanish and English or one that is <coughs> multicultural and diverse given that funding is a big issue of this group and taxes how are you going to pay for it number one we could probably look into getting a grant Follow writer again. Seconds. I don't believe we currently have a grant writer but we need one so that way we can write grants to the state and be awarded these grants if there's nobody seeking the, the help and the funds from the state how are we to get it also, it goes back to wasting spending. If we are wasting money on certain things, again, $2,750 on one person a day, those funds could possibly be redirected someplace else, possibly towards the education of our students. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I've extended this question to a minute and a half because it seems to be a, a rather hot issue. Ms. Figueroa, you have a minute and a half, kind of all of that, the funding, the Spanish, etc. And this was an issue that you addressed last year when you were running. So as an as a English educator, I have a great appreciation for the languages. And um, of course, I think it's imperative that our Spanish speakers learn English and the English speakers learn Spanish. When a student can graduate having uh, speak, being bilingual and, uh, and possibly even understanding or knowing a foreign language, they're far 
better off, better positioned to succeed in a global economy than they are being monolingual. Especially in today's economy, it's um, a, you can go to a job interview and you might be able to um, to be uh, ahead of a candidate that's also interviewing for the same position if you had that on, on your resume, if you were bilingual or even spoke a foreign language. I think that Hampstead is incredibly diverse and it would be ideal to see Hampstead become a language hub, be known for a, as a district that's known for language, uh, for language because we have so many people from different parts of the world. In terms of being able to fund that, oh, I, did I get 30 seconds? No. 30 seconds. Thank you. So in terms of being able to fund that, I'm happy to say that one of the initiatives that um, I was very um, you know, excited about when I came on board was to pursue the community schools strategy. This past year, the governor uh, afforded $3.1 million specifically for Hampstead and um, additional monies to other districts just like ours in order to um, address some of the needs that districts like ours um, face. So that would be a way we could fund that with the money from the community schools. Right? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Long? I have to hear a that question again because I'm not clear. Okay, so the question is about sp uh, the, the Spanish being reintroduced into the schools as a class. Um, why or why isn't that happening? Uh, the multicultural aspects, how is it going to be paid for? The community is interested in Spanish being taught in this community. And why is that not happening? There's no reason why that can't be implemented into curriculum. There really isn't a, a, an obstacle as I see it. I think that it can begin as young as kindergarten to first grade with dual language. And I think it can go all the way up with direct instruction regarding a second language. Uh, I, I, I can't, there's no reason why we can't have that. That should take a tremendous amount of the, um, doing. <coughs> it's not particularly difficult. It just requires planning and curriculum uh, implementation. However, I don't know if this is what meant by the question or what was meant by the question. I do think it's extremely important that we do put a lot into Spanish-speaking children being taught English. And that is the focus of the bilingual program now. I think that there's no injustice in that. And they're in America and they're going to have to know how to speak English if they're going to be successful at all. We will learn Spanish, French, any number of languages, and that will be an access to us uh, as we go on with education and with later on in life and jobs. But they have to live, and they're gonna have to live in, a, and they're living in a society that basically speaks English. So I don't see any injustice at all in making sure that those programs are addressed. How we pay for it? Grants is always a fallback. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Figueroa, this question's for you. This one's a little bit easier, I hope. Uh, has a parent, uh, uh, there seems to be a specific issue in here, but a parent of a child uh, was injured evidently, and uh, they want to know how you would address uh, keeping the students and the staff safe at the, at the schools. So <coughs> as a member of the board, we have the ability to give directive to our superintendent and the district has its wealth of administrators and staff. <coughs> in addition to ensuring that the finances are, um, that we're watching the finances, we also understand that we have a security issue in the district. We have um, an uptick in gang violence across Long Island, and, um, and we understand that's a very real present danger in our own schools. So it's really important that we have qualified, competent people who are in charge to run their different departments. And with regard to security, it's my hope that with the new superintendent coming in, the board will be able to reorganize in terms of our security and ensure that safety is the first priority of uh, the district. And so we have to make sure that we have <coughs> someone running that department to ensure that our district is safe, the students and the teachers alike. Um, they are our front line. 
So it's so important that we keep them safe. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wong? Yes, my, my response is not as dramatic as that. <laughs> we understand that it's um, that gang violence is a reality and that's something that needs to be addressed. But I'm more concerned with the day-to-day -day functioning and the different issues that come up. When a student is hurt, um, that particular situation should have really this. When you have children who are middle school age, not high school, a little bit better control, middle school, they are just everywhere. I mean, that's just the phase of development, and it's okay. But we have to have security available. We have to have them lining the hallways. Everybody has to be focused. If we're child-centered, we're gonna be focused on their safety, passing through the halls, in uh, unstructured activities, cafeteria, that's what's going to happen. And everybody has to enjoy security is first, and we do need more. Thank you. That's what the taxes are for. Thank you. Okay. Um, Melissa Figueroa mentioned that you know the security staff is the first line of you know defense. But I want to say that the school board is the community's first line of defense when it comes to the day-to-day -day actions of the school district. We should be involved in what, and know what's going on in these buildings that we you know supervise. You have to hire a superintendent, but we should be taking daily visits to these facilities. If we had we done that, we would have known the ratio of student to security staff or you know population in the facility to security. To have only 13 to yeah, 13 security guards in one building is a disgrace. And also, there should be some accountability when it comes to you know the safety of our students. So not just the, the director of security, but also the director of you know. Sorry, people, personnel services. There's no ice packs when it came to helping that lady who got injured, and nobody called 911 when that young lady was not unconscious. And to me, that's the problem, and we don't wait until next year to hire a new superintendent. We wait tomorrow to find out what's the problem and fix it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Long, this question's for you, and it's kind of a follow-up to this last one. Uh, so they talked about uh, keeping the students and the staff safe. Uh, there's some concern about our, our the buildings here in the uh, district and so what are you going to do about unsafe unhealthy uh, buildings that are in the district okay you talk about the buildings themselves and not program correct okay this is more the in building structure question the building we need an entire <coughs> analysis like I said we can no longer go with band-aids and, and anti uh, neosporin. We can't do it anymore. It's too extensive. The damage to the buildings are too extensive. It's not that anybody did the damage. They're old. They're going to be in your own house. You have to do consistent upkeep and maintenance. You do one big thing a year and then you do little things throughout the year. That's what we have to do here. And we haven't done it. We even have nurses' stations that are crumbling. That's not the place where you want to have um, places that need painting and updating. You want that to be fresh, clean, and ready to receive children. So we're going to have to do a whole facilities analysis and not play jokes with it and have meetings to make ourselves feel important. We're going to have to dig in and really, building by building, take a look at what we need. And Mr. Stiz, thank you. I concur in part, again, you do need to do a study, but you also need to act for the involvement of the community. Um, the school needs to do its part, but let's partner with the village and see if we can get code enforcement involved. Let's see if we can't get the fire inspector involved. And when I was in the fire department, I had to walk um, Prospect School before it opened. Um, shortly after it opened, I realized that there was an air conditioning issue, you know, but nobody brought it back to the fire department um, in an official complaint. Let's talk to the fire marshal and see how we can fix the leaking problems. You know, let's do a walk through of these facilities and see what the problems are and work together to address them. And when we do that, you know, you'll, I, I guess that's community participation and we can get things done quicker with the help of other entities in the community. Thank you. Ms. Figueroa? So the question is how we can keep our buildings safer? Yes, what, what would you do? At, it's more an infrastructure question now. It's like, you know, there are problems with the buildings, there are problems with the facilities. How and when are those going to be addressed? I think, again, um, 
so to answer the question, it's really important that we have a collaborative body among from teachers, students, parents, administrators, um, all the staff, and working together. We understand that in the business department, we're working on a budget. If every single dollar, and, and the trustees, again, our responsibility is to keep a watch on the money. Um, if we knew that every single dollar of a nearly $200 million budget was allocated correctly, we would know that every department can be properly funded, and we can ensure that with the proper leadership, we would be able to get a lot more done. Just the other day after the last board meeting, someone was jumping over the fence right after everyone was gone, and thanks to an incredible security guard who saw them hopping the fence, she turned, she got in her car, turned on her high beams, started to pursue the, the <coughs> curb, and saw other people hopping over the Talking fence. Talking about the buildings now. These, are, these were um, sure. bounty hunters, so the reality is that we have a very unsafe situation in our district so it's imperative that we do provide safe buildings and personnel who are going to ensure the safety of our staff and students thank you so much uh, mr. Stith what would you do to involve more community members in school efforts board meetings uh, PTO PTA etc board meetings we can make the board meetings more accessible to the community, probably by moving back to the middle school where it's kind of central in the village. This is one side of the town, and this is a community who rely heavily on public transportation. School board meetings start publicly at 7 o'clock at night, and sometimes, you know, people just tired when they come home. So it's a little bit central and, and, and more safe for people to get home at night in a community that um, relies on public transportation. Also, some activities can be held closer to their homes as well, closer, you know, in one of these elementary schools. Everything doesn't have to be at one time, and it doesn't have to be at night. And maybe we can work together in finding means of transportation, because that is a huge problem when it comes to Thank you. Ms. Figueroa? So, um, one of the items that we can um, really really celebrate is the reality of community schools. Community schools would do just that. It would be um, an opportunity and a strategy for that would really foster inclusion of every stakeholder in the community. Um, in addition to that, we have a district website that should be, re, should be um, redone. The district website is a great way to communicate with um, people in the community, but also you'll all notice there's a new marquee right in front of the high school. I'm really happy about that because <coughs> Obviously, that's one way that passers-by can see what's happening in the district. Um, in addition to that, there's many things that we can do, and I hope that once we do roll out the strategy of a community school in the district, that will afford the opportunity for folks to understand, almost serve as a community, uh, a community center, where people can come and um, find information, and also know that they'll be able to access resources and all the things our district really does afford, but people unfortunately kind of miss out on because they may not be aware. Thank you. Uh, Ms. DeLong? <coughs> um, I think we're going to have to move away from the niceties of having community groups so that they don't uh, object in board meetings and keep them quiet. I think what we have to do now is establish viable community groups that are willing to roll up their sleeves and get down and dirty about sur solving some of these problems. And if that's program development, if it, whatever the difficulty is, but I mean really, really hard working groups. We have a lot of really bright people here. I mean, I've worked with parents for 40 years and I'm telling you, we have tremendous resources here, but we're not utilizing them properly. We don't need to just scratch the surface. We have to get down together, not the arguing, not the fussing. We're putting our minds together so we can get some of these things put into place to alleviate the difficulties of <coughs> children. Thank you. So uh, I was really torn between which question to do next, but you've all sort of spoken about community schools in a sense. Uh, and so the next question, in a way, is specific to you, Ms. Figueroa, and you happen to be next. Community school money is not necessarily to teach students a second language. Thank you. 
community school money is only a few million dollars and not necessarily renewable. So where would funds come from for community schools going forward? So that initiative for community schools is actually um, an ongoing program that is provided by the state of New York. It's not simply for the 15, 16, 16, 17, <coughs> or 17, 18 school years. It's a long-term initiative and it's a strategy that will be funded by the state according to the current, um, the current budget from the state of New York. That's information that can be found on the district. It's not going to, um, there's no intention for that money or that grant to end at the end of the 17, 18 school year. Um, that's a long-term plan and strategy. And I actually want to encourage everyone, um, if you can, check out Cincinnati Schools, and you can see um, that their school district was um, radically reformed. It's a national model for community schools. So people can kind of learn a little more about how that strategy really can reform a district similar to ours that has the same issues. Okay, uh, I'm going to give her a follow-up question, another 30 seconds for her, so everyone else will have a minute and a half. What is the long-term effect of the community school model on the existing school system and the village as a whole? I think uh, the long-term effect of the community school system would be nothing but um, positive in that the community would now have an opportunity to come together <coughs> under one roof, collaborate, and access services and resources that they might not have otherwise been able to attain. For example, if a student has trouble seeing the chalkboard, um, the community uh, coordinator who would be working in that building would be able to assist the parents and or the student to connect with an optometrist locally. Um, and that's just an example, a, an example of how that would be uh, for the betterment of our society in Hempstead. That was, that was a little long finish of that sentence, but she did a good job. Okay, Ms. DeLong, <coughs> you got all of that? It's about uh, community schools money is not always available and it's only a few million dollars. Can you imagine that we say that? And uh, it's not necessarily renewable, so where would additional funding come from? And what are the long-term effects of the community school model uh, on the existing school system and the village as a whole? A minute and a half. Um, in many ways, without recognizing it and coining it community school, we really have moved in that direction. We have Withrop, that's a part of, he, of the high school that really is district-wide. We have mental health services on the fourth floor. There are a lot of things that are in place. We're on the brink of, of the community schools model as it stands. <laughs> If we properly use our community resource, resources, a lot of this won't cost us direct money from the school budget. They have personnel. They let, want to be, become a part of the schools. They've been, since I started back in 1980, they wanted to be a part of the school system. And it had to be organized and set up and accountability and parental permission and all of that has to be worked out. But it won't cost as much as you think <coughs> because we have a wealth of community resources right here in Hempstead and surrounding areas. So that's, that's, that's part of it. The money will be coming. I mean, sure, we do always ways we use money. But I'm telling you, we can have resources, students, interns, numerous things that could bring resources into the school to draw it together with the community. One last little thing I'm going to squeeze in. We can provide daycare mm -hmm. after school, after school daycare. Thank you. And that's another resource. Okay, glad you snuck in that into the sentence. Uh, and when I think of community schools, I think of a math equation, simple addition, community plus schools. So I entered Hempstead High School in 2005, graduated in 2008. I could see apparently that there was community involvement. You think of the team center, you think of Winthrop, like Ms. DeLong mentioned. You think of the interns that were in the building. We have Bridge to Promise that's currently working with our high school right. students. You have people in the community that are willing to do, that willing to work and be available for our students on a daily basis. 
But in order to tap into those resources, we have to be willing to work with the community. Mm -hmm. And you would know that if you was a part of the community. So community schools would definitely be a beneficial um, asset to our students. Why? Because they'll have the resources needed at a no cost to the district or no extra cost to the district so that way when they leave high school they'll become, you know, professional young adults that can um, get back to the community. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Figueroa? Oh, excuse me, you did? Yes. yes. You were first? Yes. yes. You gave me these. Oh, yeah, you know, I put number 11. Excuse me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Miss, uh, uh, Miss DeLong. Um, this is kind of a two-fold question, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, there's divisiveness in this community. Mm -hmm. And uh, board meetings are disruptive. Um, how, how would you address the divisiveness and make the board meetings more manageable and productive for the community at large? The two major factors, as I see. One, if the board amongst themselves are not able to come to the table to reason together. That's going to spill over, no matter how you cut it. One way to do that is stay away from personal things. Stay away from gossip. Stay away from vengeful behavior. Uh, the nonsense. When an issue comes up, focus on the issue. Lay out what's positive, what's negative, and try to reason together in making an effective decision. The other part is, oh, let me think, I, I knew what it was. I, I, caught, I see what you did to me, I forgot. <laughs> the divisiveness and how to manage it. Okay, the other thing is, what you absolutely cannot do, you cannot look down on the community. Mm -hmm. You cannot do it. You cannot think that they're just cut, crawled out of their homes mm -hmm. just to hear see a show or to, to create havoc. You can't look down on the community. Mm -hmm. You must see them not only as equals, but in fact, we are here to serve them. Mm. They're not here to serve us. Thank you. Beautiful. Well said. Well said. Well said. Well said. Well your applause or else you're going to have to applaud for everybody. No, no. no we don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my opinion, the community isn't divisive. I think the community is heartbroken. The community is very much upset. Why? Because we are failing our students and the students are getting you know, the raw end of the deal. We put people in place to represent the community, but yet they aren't you know, available to the community. The school board currently been having more executive sessions and they've been having public sessions. And don't take the concerns of the community you know, to, you know, seriously. Um, and the, the school board has to be able to work together. When the, when the community see that there's no you know, inclusion and diversity, um, and the thoughts of ideas of the school board members themselves, then how do you expect the students to take, you know, heed to the example? Um, how can we change that? <coughs> we can start by, you know, being respectful to each other, taking heed to the recommendations of the community, and working to put forth a plan that's going to best fit our students in the long run. Thank you. Ms. Figueroa? It is true that um, if you attend meetings, you see there is a lot of tension is a lot of um, uh, divisiveness and hostility in the room sometimes I feel like you could, you could cut the tension with a scissor um, that is very sad um, because it really is to the adults in our community to demonstrate and model for our children for our youth how we should behave generally in society when we're in public and even when we're in private so it's my hope that um, we can have somewhat of a culture campaign Perhaps a culture campaign that fostered love and kindness, respect, um, would really help our students who right now aren't necessarily um, being taught that. <coughs> Some of our children are coming from broken homes. And so just really dealing with the social peace component and that human peace <coughs> of our students yeah. is so important. There certainly is this conversation and this feeling of otherness in Hempstead. And I hope that this community will know that each one of us really, we really are a lot more, um, we have a lot more in common, we are a lot more alike than we are different. Um, okay, I, I really don't think I, I, any of you have addressed the real question here. Because 
each of you s would be sitting on the school board. The meeting becomes disruptive. There's the contention that you've already addressed that's going on. How are each of you sitting at that table, being a player, going to make it stop and move the board in a different direction that is more beneficial to this community? Specifics. Go ahead. You're, excuse me, I'm sorry, Ms. DeLong, you are next. 30 seconds. Let's give them a minute for this. This is a big question. It seems like this is something really the community wants to know. They don't want this to go on. Last year, this was a huge issue. Clearly, it hasn't been addressed. But it doesn't start overnight. The resentment, the dissension, the, the and what are you going to do? From the what are you going to do go sitting at that table Number one. at the first board meeting? Preventive measures are essential. If, look, I can come out two different ways, and more, everybody could. You can come out welcoming, you can come out not faking it, listening, you want to hear, you want involvement, or you can come out and sit back and you're the queen on the throne and you want to hear what the subjects have to say. There are two ways to approach it, and all of it can be nonverbal. So what I'm saying is you have to fix your mind on the board that you're going to receive the community as important and viable. It's not and the community, it will it's within the board itself. Yes, it will prevent, what do you say it again? It's the board itself that is contentious and divisive. Mm -hmm. That's what the community is saying. They don't want to see anymore. And divisive with one and another. And so what or are you going, no, not with the community. Okay. They want to know yeah. how the board is going to get its act together okay. and start acting like Then you're like going to have adults. to focus on issues. You're going to have to get away from the gossip and the personal feelings, all of that. Erase it. Make, put it to the side and deal with the issue. You're dealing with the issue and the issue has to be child-centered. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stooth. As a member of the school board, I would definitely um, make sure that I show up prepared, show show up professional, with an open mind and um, and, a, and a mutual respect for the other school board members. Um, not with this. You know the notion that I'm just going to work with two others, which you know, with myself included, would make up the majority. I would work with all four other school members, school board members. Also, I stop uh, blaming the past administration for things that's currently going on. If I'm a school board member on day one, I take responsibility for what's going on. I take responsibility for knowing what's going on. If I don't know what's going on, it's my responsibility to find out and make the necessary, um, you know, inquiries to our superintendent for recommendations. Also. I'll be available to the community and to the staff and to the superintendent. So when we're discussing things in public sessions, number one, I'm not going to vote to go into you know um, secret session for no reason. But I'll make sure that when we're discussing <laughs> and voting on issues, that I'll give you know a specific reason on why it's a yay or a nay. So that way the community knows where I'm coming from. Thank you. Mr. Girl. So uh, something that the board could do to make our meetings better. Um, I'm not going to paint a pretty picture. The reality is... What can you district, do? What yeah. can you do because you're sitting at the table? So yes, I'm is. one person on a five-seat board. Oh, so no. there's nothing that any one trustee can do to fix the situation. Totally not true. The reality is the community and the board in particular has to work together. So long as the board is not working together, that's going <coughs> to translate to the community. And at the moment, unfortunately, we do have a lot of dysfunction and the board is not always working together on all matters. Uh, I know one step that this board has taken to improve the leadership of the district and help us get the district moving in the direction um, it should, uh, we've taken a step by hiring a new superintendent. And so that, is, that is one step that we've actually taken to ensure proper leadership oh and God. you know make sure this district goes uh, in the district in the direction that we really need to move. Yes, stop, stop, please. <laughs> Killing me. Uh, <laughs> what do you see as a major issue facing our district and public education? 
and what is your vision for this district? The major issue that's facing our district in regards to public education is the overcrowding of these buildings. Each building has, has an influx of students. You have some odd 30, 40 students in each classroom. Some of these kids are sitting on top of teacher's desk. Some of these kids don't have any textbooks to learn, especially those that don't speak the English language, and especially the 15% of students who speak a different language other than English and Spanish. There's nobody directly teaching them. So I want to say that the teaching staff are stressed with the job and responsibility of teaching our students, but they don't have the resources. And we're not getting help from the state because, we're, in my opinion, we're not asking for help from the state. I see with the proper, with the proper you know, guidance that Hempstead can produce more Travis Nelsons that are actually you know, being accepted into mm -hmm. Ivy League schools. I, I see students who are actually graduating and ready to enter the, the outside world and be productive citizens if we get our act together. Mm, thank you. Uh, Miss F, <laughs> I'm being fair. Oh, okay, right. oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Did you repeat the question? Uh, what do you see as a major issue facing our district and public education, and what is your vision for our district? So we have many major issues in our district. Um, I'm not going to say that one is more important than the other. Every issue that the district has should be addressed equally. Uh, but they can't. The so pick out an issue so that you think. Right now, for as a board member, <coughs> prioritize right now, these issues. The most important thing is to ensure that we remain fiscal watchdogs of the money. We know for a fact that um, what's happened financially in our district, uh, there's really no answer. So why? What we've done is put a resolution forward for a forensic audit, approve a utility audit. These are measures that we've actually taken in order to identify areas where this district has fallen short, be able to identify those areas, and then when we have those reports, we can put some controls in place so as not to repeat those same errors. That's, those are real tangible ways and methods that we continue to move forward in. Um, in addition, the community school strategy is a way that we can support districts that are in distress just like ours. Thank you. This, this is an educational institution. Our number one concern has to be the education of the children, and with this district in particular, it is related to reading. Our children are not reading on par. Thank we you. need to take a good hard look and how we're, how we're handling that. Starting with pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade. We're going to have to, we, the research says, if the child does not grasp the fundamentals by the middle of first grade, we're already in trouble. And it's showing. Every year it gets worse and worse and worse. We can't keep going on like that. We have to focus on reading. We have to put our best minds together and come up with a plan and a strategy and stick with it. Yes. Consistency. We've had so many reading programs in the district, I would be dizzy. We have to pick a plan, stick with it, assess it, and track the progress as we go along. Thank you. Okay, this is a, this is a hot issue. Uh, I, I know because I got called by Newsday about it. Um, you've dis uh, discussed transparency. I'm going to ask it kind of more specifically because we have a current board member on, but everyone kind of needs to address this. Uh, you have discussed transparency in the business office. You voted, or the board, to give a $30,000 stipend to the current treasurer who has never attended a board meeting. Uh, why was there a vote to have the current treasurer serve as the district accountant is this not a conflict of interest <coughs> so i think actually it's a misunderstanding it sounds like perhaps um the information the person whoever wrote the question 
I got asked the same question by the Newsday. So there's so there's something going on here about somebody being on the board member also being a town employee and potential conflict of interest. And what are your feelings about that? And why did you vote for it? Specifically to you. I'm a little. I'm sorry. I apologize. You're talking about a trustee who was appointed. <coughs> there is a trustee, a board, a school board, okay. that is also hired by the town. Okay. Village. 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 Excuse me. Okay. I live in Village. Uh, okay. Excuse me. And, and there's a con about the conflict of interest of having a school board member also be an employee. Yes. Uh, okay. I, 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 clarity, can you just read the question again? The question specifically speaks to the current treasurer of the, of the school of district. The school of the school large. district. Okay. Okay. Getting thirty thousand dollars a year. Which there is a current treasurer who gets a thirty thousand dollars. Yes. But she's a by day a senior accountant for the school district. So that that's not the relationship between. Yeah. This, this, um, this is the treasurer and the, the okay. village. We're talking okay. about senior yeah. accounting yeah. and the treasurer. Thank you for that yeah. clarification. Right. However, I also do think so that there the is a board member <laughs> <laughs> who <laughs> is <laughs> a <laughs> member <laughs> of the city. <laughs> <laughs> of the village, and those are two different questions. Yes, so first, let's deal with the treasurer. Right. Okay. The treasurer was hired by the district before I arrived on the board. Um, she serves the district and she's compensated for the work that she does. Um, I do not determine what the salary compensation is, um, but I can tell you that if she is working and has been serving the district for many years, I personally have no concern or issue with our current accountant. So, um, but I respect the fact that folks are concerned with her employment here. That's their prerogative. But in terms of the quality of work she's been able to perform, outstanding. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we are able to retain such um, incredible staff, just like our accountant, who's done a great service for our community. So you see no conflict of interest? Well, what would the conflict be? That's that the question the audience is asking you. The is there a conflict of interest? Do, the conflict the of interest had to do with the issue at the village <laughs> with a trustee on the no, board the of being employed with the by the village. The so that's a the separate issue. Person. I think you're mixing both no, questions. No, the question says, the, the, the questionnaire says that the, why you voted to have the current treasurer serve as the district accountant is this not a conflict of interest? Yes. So you're saying no, it's not? No, as in with the okay. knowledge that I have, there's no conflict of interest okay. with regard Thank to you. our conflict. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ms. DeLong, we're just dealing with the treasurer at this point. Right. Uh, I don't know the specifics of that, that the details of both of those positions as they relate one to the other. But it has been, a, not that this makes, justifies it, but it has been a position and a configuration for many years, and I have not really heard a lot of um, disagreement about it until more recently. So I'm not sure how to respond to that other than that. I don't know the details of those positions and how they interface. Thank you. Mr. S. <laughs> I think it's a clear um, conflict of interest. Why? Because this lady is employed by the Hempstead School District and by day she's the accountant so she's doing audits you know by day. Um, but then by night she's getting paid extra monies from the district to, to be the treasurer. So she's cutting checks but she's basically overseeing herself. There's no transparency in that respect and she does not come to the school board meetings. She's a direct employee of the school board so I don't understand why other direct employees such as the superintendent is to report and be available to the community and the treasurer does not. There's a, there's a clear, you know, conflict of interest there. If, if the superintendent has to be available to the community to answer questions, I think she should be as well. Okay. Uh, Ms. DeLong, now we're going to go to the other question, which is someone on the school board working for the village. <coughs> is there a conflict of interest there? Well, number one, it's not the first time it's happened. Right. That's oh, number one. That's not the question. No, no, I just wanted okay. to add that. Good. All right. That's not the first time it's happened. <laughs> I do not foresee a conflict of interest based on my knowledge 
of how that's going to work right now, from what I can anticipate and see. Um, I don't know that we, I don't think that there will be. As a matter of fact, it could serve us well, because a lot of what goes on in the district should spill over to the village. And the village should have some input into what we're doing here. There should be an interface and a working cooperatively. Now, I'm saying that with much hesitation because I have to see how this is going to work. The last time it happened, the other person left the Board of Education way in advance of being able to observe how this plays out. Thank you. Mr. I don't see that as being a conflict of interest. Uh, we are an incorporated village. We're not an incorporated city such as New York City, where the mayor would be over all public schools. So the school district, um, school board in itself, actually are uh, charged with the oversight of you know the school district. Um, the trustee in question works for the village by day, but you know is available to school district when there's meetings or whenever he needs to be, and that could be an added advantage. I, I'm reminded to maybe two meetings ago when there was an issue of parking spaces at an off-site campus on Nicholas Court. And I think we was paying maybe $15 an hour for parking. You know, now we have this person who actually works for the village who could probably broker a better deal for the district. So we got to look at it as an added advantage instead of a um, conflict of interest. Thank you. Ms. Thank you for the question. The issue of having a Board of Education trustee working as a trustee in the village is no conflict of interest at face value. Um, that's perfectly legal. However, the conflict of interest does arise and has arrived at, for example, the first village board meeting when the trustee decided to make a motion to actually hire a fellow trustee that was on the Board of Education. So if you have two people working on the board of Ed, and now one has been elected to work at the village, before uh, an executive session is held, um, items of personnel should be discussed in executive session. But at the very first village board meeting, the village board decided to appoint a local reverend, two local reverends, uh, one at a salary of six, uh, $100,000, six-figure salary. This comes at the taxpayer's expense. <laughs> so whether or not the board was able to go into an executive session and able to negotiate a salary or discuss personnel, that never happened. So when you look at that, that is a conflict of interest. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Mr. S. What do you think should be the specific attributes for choosing a superintendent? And what would make that superintendent the ideal choice for the community? Number one, we can talk about, um, if not residency, because I understand that there's a lot of talent in Hempstead, but you do um, want to do a national search for a superintendent. We may not pick a superintendent from Hempstead, but we would want to look for talent that actually you know, represents the makeup of the community. Uh, somebody that's possibly African American or Latino, or understands the makeup and the difficulty, the makeup of the community and the difficulties that we face here in Hempstead specifically, not just coming with what they've done in their specific, you know, school district that really doesn't <coughs> anything that goes on in this school district. And what's the important question? Uh, what would make the super t the ideal choice for the community? Specific attributes, ideal choice. Someone that's educated and somebody that's, you know, come with a heart for the children. Mm -hmm. Heart for the children and with a plan to, you know, further education in the right way and not, uh, you know, I want to say something that's politically incorrect. But somebody that actually understands the makeup of the community and that's here for the students. I'll Thank you. Ms. Uh, <coughs> Um, so I actually just participated in the national search for the superintendent and in doing that we were deliberate to include the community and assemble what was a professional profile that's been on the district website you can see it on our home page and there you can see the items and characteristics that our community um, contributed to the professional profile things that they wanted to see someone who um, has a proven track record of success someone who can understand the culture of our community 
which by the way is not only a black and brown community, but people from other races and ethnicities live here too. Mm -hmm. Someone who's going to be able to lead and, and be able to deal with the opposition and the challenges that they, we know very well they'll be met with upon arrival. Someone who can um, galvanize our village and really you know, foster togetherness and unity here. Someone who understands the difference between what test scores are and what's actually being learned. Someone who can develop our staff and continue to, you know, impress how how important it is we have to come together. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I'm sorry. I want to make sure I stay focused on the budget. What are the specific <coughs> attributes that you'd be looking for for a superintendent that would make him and him or her an ideal choice for this community? We need to have a superintendent that is a very and exceptionally strong leader. I don't mean an abusive leader. I don't mean a dictatorial leader. I don't mean a, crit a, le a leader that criticizes and um, <coughs> involves him or herself in negative interactions with our staff, but a leader that's strong and compassionate. At the same time, there'll be times when you have to make very hard decisions and I think that that has to be sometimes you have to let people go but I think that they have to be very very careful about how they interact with staff we know the children are of first concern that's what we know that that should always happen but how staff is treated is really a big deal this staff in particular has been bounced around a lot Thank I'm you. going to be fair, and they need to have some belief and some understanding. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, kind of some quick bullet points here. Uh, Ms. F, starting with you. What's your plan to address the pilot? <coughs> so I want to be really candid with you in answering this. As a Board of Education, um, the issue of pilots continue to uh, present themselves at our board meetings. We have a former board um, member here tonight who has participated in our meetings in the public portion and raises the issue of pilots. Um, my focus is education, just to be very clear. So I'm not um, concerning myself as a first priority with the issues of housing that are very real in our community, affordable housing. Um, and we have a gamut of issues. But with regard to pilots, I could tell you this, quite frankly, that is not my, um, my business necessarily. My business is to ensure the welfare of the youth that are within our school district. That's my focus. And secondary to that is to ensure that every single tax dollar of the residents of this community is allocated properly and effectively. Thank you. Ms. Dean? Did you say you were next? Um, this is pilots in terms of pilot programs? No. Payment in lieu of taxes, pilots. <laughs> no, I don't understand. I'm sorry, I didn't know to go to the next person. Uh, pilot is payment in lieu of taxes. It's the acronym for pilot. Pilot, payment in lieu of taxes. What are your what's your, what is your plan to address? <coughs> I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with that. But I must have heard about it in a different way, and I'm not understanding. Thank you. It's not. It's not really. I'm a school school person. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. S. Because they could stop. Them. I think pilots are definitely a school board member's concern. It should be the, the, the concern of the community. We are allowing these these apartment buildings to be built here, house persons, you know, that's against the cold of the community. You have maybe about six, seven, eight people in, in, in one apartment dwellings, and they're sending their kids to the district, and we have to educate them but not be compensated by the taxes. So the, the owner of the apartment buildings are not paying their fair share of taxes uh, for, per kid or per, per pupil, and it's you know becoming the burden of the taxpayer. So it is our concern as a school board member. What I would do to address it is I'll be vocal and I will lobby. I will lobby the town board because they make the decisions over there at One Greenwich, and I will you know make sure I'm present at this, the village board meetings to make sure that they're vocal 
you know, at the town, making sure that our concerns are being met. And if I have to, I'll go to New York State and meet with the commissioner and let her know that this is not fair. This is what's going on in our community and something needs to be done. That the, the county, the town cannot keep allowing these persons to have to have tax breaks and send kids here and we don't and we're not getting the funds for them. And it is a safety concern for our kids. I went in one home where there was about ten people in one apartment building. That is unsafe. Thank you. Uh, this is D. Uh, well, I, I guess, I don't know if you got all the applause the first time, but we'll get that to that later. Uh, Mrs. D, uh, what are your top three educational priorities that you want to address to impact student improvement? You're talking to me? Yes. Oh, you said D, I wasn't sure. <laughs> There's only one here, right? <laughs> okay, but I was all right. Okay. Sorry about that. The number one, of course, like I said, reading. Not reading. just academic <coughs> across the board are important, but this reading uh, issue is really, really, um, we're so severely behind. That has to be a number one priority. Um, number two has to do with our fiscal management, how we're handling things, the waste, the waste, the waste, everybody say. $2,700 a day, a day, I'm saying it's really 4000 2700 is 3000 and then another 1000 makes 4000 a day, okay? The waste has to go. Um, facilities is another major issue. Not only are our, uh, do our, does our property look bad, but our buildings are crumbling. Thank you. Uh, Mr. S, top three priorities. Educational priorities? Top three uh, educational priorities that I would have to say, number one is consistency and structure. For the past couple of years, we haven't had a permanent superintendent. We haven't had a permanent principal for um, the high school, middle school. We haven't had permanent assistant principals. Everything is changing when it comes to the reading program or the structure of the high school. Uh, this past year, we went from nine periods to eight periods. Things that's just, there's no consistency. We need consistency and structure. We can't, you know, commit ourselves to a schedule when we, you know, want our students to. We need consistency and um, oversight over the resources. The kids need textbooks. The kids need paper. The, key, the kids need um, access to the internet to do the work. And it's not fair that we put the burden on our teachers who spend their <coughs> own funds to, 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 to rely on the resources. And also safety. We gotta get kids to school. It's not fair to expect kids on the heights to walk through hostile environments to get all the way to 201 President Street or 70 Greenwich. We need to provide busing and we need to uh, make sure that there's safety in the school buildings. Hiring more um, security staff is a, is a major issue on that. Thank you. Ms. So the question is, um, <coughs> what are the top priorities? Top three educational, I, you know, I know there's so many, but we're only gonna limit you to three. Uh, priorities that you would like to address and that would have an impact on uh, improving uh, the students' educational experience here. Thank you. So again, um, my top priority remains to be a fiscal watchdog <coughs> and to um, ensure that our finances are properly managed within the district. That's our number one problem right now. Um, second, I want to ensure that we get our, our students and staff safe. We know very well that um, security is not as optimal as, as it can be. Um, and also, um, with on that note of providing safety for our students, you'll see in the budget we allocated the $200,000 for busing. So we wanna start to build a fleet of buses. Um, the district is well funded. The issue is how monies are being allocated and, and distributed. And so um, I absolutely, is a priority to start to bring in the two buses in this coming year and then grow that <coughs> uh, fleet of buses so that the district will be able to um, support itself and save millions upon millions of dollars ultimately um, with, that, with that effort. I know $9 million was um, spent with transportation and we still have issues with transportation, so. Thank you. <coughs> so on a, a completely different kind of vein, uh, excluding students and faculty, what do you think is the greatest strength of the district? Mr. S, you're next. Uh, what is the greatest strength of the district <coughs> and why? 
I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? <laughs> I'm so distracting, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> students and faculty, what do you think is the greatest strength of the district and why? Excluding students and faculty, what is the greatest strength? I'm sorry, I, I don't think you have a district without the students and the faculty. And the strength of the district is actually pride of itself. We're tigers. Anybody that's from them said know that we tiger, the tiger roar. And this place once was the place to be in the community. This was the top school. You couldn't beat us in sports. You, you couldn't beat us. Our students excelled in um, academic achievements. And even though things aren't as well as it should be, um, we have hope in the future that it will be back, be that again. So the, the pride um, in Hempstead School District definitely comes from its students and its staff. We're Tigers. Thank you. Uh, Ms. F? So I think the greatest strength of our community is our diversity. It really is um, the diversity. That's the beauty of Hempstead. Um, it's those differences that make us we are and I think instead of you know being fearful of the otherness about our neighbors if, if we can embrace one another and I truly do believe in that human potential in all of us um, that really is the beauty of Hempstead and, and a real great opportunity that we have is to embrace our diversity thank you that's excluding students, students and, and faculty. faculty then in that case <coughs> Our number one strength is our parents. Our parents. I've worked with parents and families for years and years and years. And some of the obstacles that they ride past, that they overcome, that they're able to work through, they have a tremendous amount to offer the district. And I think we're not utilizing, it proper, utilizing them properly. We're not appreciating them properly. We're not um, <coughs> setting up committees and so forth properly so that we get the best from our parents in an organized way. But I'm telling you, we have some of the best, the strongest, a lot of single parent homes, a lot of single mothers, some very, very strong people here who are really <coughs> right and very overlooked. Thank you. So I have a great deal of respect for these three uh, people from the community so that have stepped up to run for this op for the office of school board uh, they will now each have three minutes to uh, give a closing statement um, one of the questions from someone in the community which I think ought to be addressed in your closing statement is I'm an undecided voter why should I cast my vote for you what is your vision for the district moving forward. With that, three minutes, and we started with Miss Is D. So we will start with you, Mr. S. Take your notes down. All right. Okay, so you have to um, excuse my response, but I'm going to be real to my Hempstead community. I'm from here and I carry the passion of Hempstead students. These kids are, these students are, you know, more closer to me than they are to my two opponents. Not saying that in a disrespectful way, but it's just the way the numbers work. And it saddens me when I see that they get in the raw end of the deal. So I'm coming with the passion of the students and the understanding that we have to work together. You need inclusion and diversity on that school board and you need a sense of, or a mind to work together. Put your personal, you know, feelings aside, and you know, roll up your sleeves and say that we're going to make it work for the students. It cannot work for the superintendent or work for this principal and not work for these kids. If it's not working for them, it's not working for me, and it shouldn't work for you either. So I refer to myself kind of in the sense of the, the the trauma doctor. I work in the medical field, and anybody that's been to the hospital knows that the first person you see is the doctor in the emergency room. And should you require further assistance, you're going to meet the specialist. The specialist may be a cardiologist, the specialist may be a neurosurgeon. I recognize the emergency here in the Hempstead School District. <laughs> Our kids aren't getting the resources that they need. They don't have safe facilities. 
and nobody is doing anything. But yet we can hire people uh, and give them a tremendous amount of money when we can really be redirecting those funds back to where they really belong, and which is in the classrooms and available to our students. So, my name is Randy and I'm ready on day one to work together with the rest of the school board to make sure that we put our students first. Hempstead community has got to take the community back and make sure we're raising our kids and make sure they have the resources they need at the completion of 12th grade to go out there and seek higher education should they choose or at least be re ready to go out to the work field and make a living for themselves and come back in the community and be well productive citizens. And that's what I'm running on, students first. Gets applause now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I have to do it all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in this position for one year now. I think my voting record uh, speaks for itself. Yeah. And I would like you know folks to just know that my aim is to continue standing up for social justice, for ensuring an equitable education for all the students in our district, ensuring that I continue to be an advocate for the parents and an ear that will lend itself to listen, continue listening to the teachers um, when they're reaching out to be able to really afford and, and make myself available to the community so that I can, um, so that I can continue to just, from my position, um, drive those issues home and work with the board so that we can arrive at that end. So we all want good things to happen. I foresee a healthy student body. I foresee in five years our community coming together, not just in the, within the school district, but also with the village. We have a new village administration, and wouldn't it be nice if we can really bridge that gap that has been for so many years, the separation between the village and the school district. Um, I think also the teachers are long overdue <coughs> for a fair contract. That's something that I really hope we can really um, address um, sooner than later. And so um, I, I just know that there's so much potential in our district and within five years um, with the right leadership and um, proper you know, um, community working together <coughs> and really deliberately collaborating and knowing that you really want to bring this community together as opposed to you know fostering the otherness, we really are able to realize a true revitalization in Hempstead and really reform public education in Hempstead. This is doable and we're doing it. It's happening. Thank you. I too am a graduate of kindergarten through 12th grade here in Hempstead. This is my home will always be my own. Uh, I'm glad to that I bring able to bring back 40 years of experience, good and bad, trial and error, to back to the school board so I can serve the community. I have uh, a lot of insight. I do not mean gossip. I have a <laughs> lot of insight <laughs> into different situations just from years of living it and living it and living it like I mentioned, like those reading programs that we almost all drowned in. Um, I just think that if you depend on me, I will be fair. I'm known to be fair. I don't belong to any faction. I made a point of financing my own campaign because I didn't want to be owned by anyone. I wanted to be able to make clean decisions so that I don't feel like I owe anybody anything. I only owe the children the right to have a fair decision made and the parents as well. So if you trust me, give me the opportunity, I promise you not only do I consider it a privilege, but I'll treat it like it is. Thank you.
they educate or help educate our children. <coughs> the last thing I want to say, two last things. One, I've moderated a lot, a fair number of, of events. This is my favorite place to come because you all are so passionate about your school board, your schools, your kids, your families. And you should give yourselves all a huge pat on your back for that.